Oh, back again. Where the hell did my... From last night, because we spend, you know, basically, some people say I spend all day smoking pot. I don't. I don't fucking uh, get baked until I'm done with everything else. Or when I'm doing this. So, uh, today's September 12th. I guess I should date these things. Uh, for those of you who have, who have tuned in, I thank you if you've enjoyed the thing and commented. I thank you very much. If you've subscribed, I thank you again for subscribing. But today, came to realize that while most of the genre filmmakers from, you know, the 60s to the mid-80s have had their work basically... Um, put on DVD, Blu-ray, uh, box sets, whatever. Sadly, there's one very important filmmaker who got left out. And if I could push this book here, called Big Bosoms and Square Jaws, uh, Russ Meyer's biography by Jimmy McDonald. Um, I was doing some research for an upcoming article in Grindhouse Purgatory, and uh, I decided to uh, check out Russ. And... Um, my exposure to Russ was, at, I guess, early 70s, because, you know, uh, the sex revolution, things like that. Uh, there was two Russ Meyer pictures playing at the Livingston Drive-In, which I eventually wound up managing for one summer. It was Harry, Cherry, and Raquel, and Finders, Keepers, Lovers, Weepers. So, being the horny teens, a couple of us jumped in my car and went up there because, you know, even though they were, quote, rated X... They weren't really checking at the box office, especially drive-ins. Um, special historical note on this thing, Livingston Drive-In was located off of Route 10 in Livingston, New Jersey, and when you went up Route 10, you sort of crested this hill and you could see the screen. Well, when they were doing Russ Meyer's stuff, I think uh, the sight of Ushi Digart's uh, huge tits on the screen caused more accidents than the local deer population. So it seemed uh, right after... Uh, a couple Russ Meyer double features. The town sort of like said, no, we can't have this anymore, and then they basically cut that whole deal off. Um, Harry Cherry and Raquel starred Charles Napier, uh, Ushi Digart, and uh, some other people that I can't remember, but the whole thing was, you know, the focus was on tits, big tits, because Russ loved big tits. And in the middle of this thing, it was sort of surreal because we were both baked and we thought we were imagining shit that this chick popped up wearing an Indian headdress and worshipping this huge phallic rock off in the distance, and that was Ushi. Um, the plot was that um, Harry, played by Charles Napier, is a sheriff uh, who was involved in a weed smuggling thing. Uh, this is like narrated to us at the beginning, this is supposed to be an anti-drug film. Well, this is a three-man weed smuggling operation. It's the old man, it's the sheriff, and this uh, Mexican guy, Enrique, who they want to get rid of. Uh, but there's also a, a monkey wrench in the works because this other guy, Apache, has also started bringing up weed. So what happens is, in between all the boobage, they decide to ambush Apache, have this little gun battle with uh, the sheriff, Enrique and Apache, and Apache is wounded, and they don't bother following him because he went out to the desert to die. Well, uh, Cherry and Raquel, which are Harry's girls, take turns taking care of the dirty old man who winds up in the hospital, and uh, Raquel goes to visit him. Well, this is where it gets weird because Raquel finds out that he has his throat cut. Um, Enrique is set out to pick up the last batch of dope, and the sheriff goes back to his cabin on this mine that he bought, this other weird little contrived thing about how he invested all his money in this silver mine or something that's failed to produce anything. But anyway, guess what? Apache ain't dead. He basically uh, chases uh, Enrique around and around in the desert till Enrique's car bogs down, then he makes a run for it, holding the weed under one arm and the switchblade in the other hand, and basically the Apache runs him over. Then it's back where he, um, he, I guess, I think I'm getting confused here, but, you know, Russ Meyer films are a bit, you know, mind-boggling. The Apache had already stolen the sheriff's Jeep, so that's what he used to run over Enrique with. 
Then he goes back and there's a pitched gun battle between the sheriff and Apache, which they both collapse bloody on top of each other. There was a backstory to the gun battle where it seems that they ran out of blanks and whoever was handling the guns decided just to shake the powder out and put shit in there, which basically could have killed somebody anyway, but, you know, that was independent filmmaking back then. You get away with shit like that. Um, none of this stuff was hardly, you know, up to the, quote, X rating we thought it was going to be up to, especially Finders, Keepers, Lovers, Weepers, which is uh, sort of like Russ Light. It's sort of like a heist film that a guy owns a strip bar named Paul, and his wife was a dancer, but she isn't allowed to dance anymore, and he's hooked up with this hooker, um, Claire, who basically has to keep him occupied because she's setting up his strip bar for a heist. Meanwhile, his bartender is banging his wife, who's, you know, who he brings her in and actually has her stripped before these guys. These guys do a time-honored tradition of hiding in the men's room until everybody leaves, but people keep coming back and shit. So, one guy's trying to torch the safe open, uh, the other guy basically is keeping a lookout, and then Paul, for some reason, comes back, they knock him out and tie him up. Then uh, the bartender, I think his name is Ray, who was, you know, banging... Paul's wife comes back with her, tells her to stay in the car, which of course she doesn't. He goes in, gets knocked out, tied up. Then she goes in and actually gets the shit beat out of her by, by this uh, henchman, uh, Feeney, I think his name was. Cal's the other guy. And uh, they tie them all up and torching the safe isn't going too well, so they want the combination. Well, Paul ain't going to give up the combination and Ray will give up the combination but he says he has to get up and actually physically do it because he has to jiggle the knob a little bit or else it won't open. Of course, he makes a run for it and gets the switchblade in the back routine. Um, being that Paul won't do it, Feeney is given permission to rape his wife on a pool table in a rough scene. And then finally, Paul does give in, tells him the combination is behind the bar. When Cal goes to find the combination, uh, Paul goes to buy the blowtorch, which is still going and burns his, his bonds off, and basically he kills Feeney. No, actually, yeah, I guess he does kill Feeney. There's a, bar, a gun behind the, the bar. He kills Feeney. Claire shows up, pissed off that this whole thing went sour, tells, you know, Ray, uh, Cal that the cops are on the way. There's a shootout. Both of them die, and basically uh, it looks like Paul was more into uh, Claire than he ever was in his wife. Weird sort of downbeat Thing for a Russ Meyer film, you know, they had the re re requisite tits and everything like that, but sort of was a downer. Now, of course, I caught this, you know, coming out of high school in the 70s. Prior to that, there were other, you know, Russ Meyer films made in, in the late 60s. Um, of course, the most infamous one would be Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which basically had no tits at all, and it just, you know, these three hot chicks, uh, Tora Santana, Haji, and Lori Williams, and this plot to rob this old guy in a wheelchair in the desert, and uh, probably, you know, the best thing, you know, it might be up for conjecture, but I think it's the best thing Russ had ever done, and, you know, um, it led uh, for other things. Um, Russ actually got hired by 20th Century Fox to make a sequel to uh, Valley of the Dolls. Of course, he was going to do it up in Russ fashion, where things got weird. And he was also uh, directed to Seven Minutes, which it, there was, there was a shake-up at Fox, and basically the stuff, like I said, the stuff was going out X-rated, but it wasn't hardcore. See, there was really no differentiation between X and XXX, because they never did that. XXX was hardcore porn, X was soft, but... Of course, that was never explained to anybody, and theaters were loath to run an X-rated movie. But Russ, for some reason, managed to bull his way into these mainstream theaters and get his stuff played. Um, now, my, my second dose of Russ Meyer was Super Vixens and Up. And a couple buddies of mine, uh, Jimmy and Ian, got baked and went to see this at the Fox Theater in beautiful Hackensack, New Jersey, on Main Street. And... Super Vixens is this weird-ass movie where everyone's super. They're, they're like, Super Angel is played by Sherry Eubanks in the beginning, and uh, she's screwing around with this guy, her husband Cliff, who's this uh, guy who's really wearing, like, very tight short shorts for some reason, which sort of segues into, like, some other weirdness later on. Um, 
he gets in a fight with her over Super Lorna because Super Lorna pulls in the gas station, which is run by Martin Borman, which is a running fucking joke because, you know, Russ was in the, the 166th uh, division in, in WW2, a, a, a photo, photography division, and basically that's where he honed his craft by, you know, staying almost to the point where he was almost getting blown up to get the shot of combat footage and stuff like that. It's also where he met his, his lifelong friend David Friedman, and all the buddies that he made in the Signal Corps wound up either working for him, you know, as technicians or actors. So that that's basically where Russ learned his craft. Plus, he was shooting still still photography in the fifties, and most of uh, the men's magazines that came out after Playboy and sometimes Playboy would feature a lot of Russ's work. So that's basically where he learned his craft. So anyway, back to Super Vixens. It's um. The sheriff, uh, played by Charles Napier, psycho Harry Sledge, who basically uh, comes in a, a, over a fight and knocks Cliff out, and you know takes Sherry to the hospital, uh, Angel to the hospital, and he's sort of smitten with her, but he's fucking crazy, and um, he comes back later, and for whatever reason he can't get it up, and for this uh, Russ employs this huge rubber cock for some reason. Of course, we're stoned in this grindhouse looking at this going, is that fucking real? So she locks herself in the bathroom and keeps taunting Harry, who was crashing through the fucking door with a butcher knife and basically ridiculing his manhood. She turns on the radio, she was doing a dance, but all of a sudden the, the door comes crashing down on her, knife hits her, he's beating her, pummeling her, throws her in the bathtub, and he's like double stomping her in the bathtub. And this is really bloody and fucking not a turn on at all. And then she's trying to crawl out of the bathtub, she's covered with blood, and he throws the radio in the bathtub. That's the end of um, Super Angel. Now, they think Cliff did this, so Cliff hits the road and gets involved with a whole bunch of weirdness, including uh, getting mugged by a future porn star, Colleen Brennan, and her boyfriend, and then she's super cherry. He gets bit by a rattlesnake, but they leave him laying there, who gets picked up by a farmer, Stort Lancaster, I believe it is, who takes him back to the farm to recuperate with his uh, Austrian mail-order bride, Super Soul, Ushi. And in this film, at least you get to see more of Ushi than we saw in Harry, Cherry, and Raquel. Because Ushi's getting banged by her old man all over the place while Cliff works. And, you know, Super Soul has the hots for Cliff, and Cliff is about to leave, gets paid off, and... He's asked to do one more thing, and then uh, he climbs up into the hayloft to throw some hay down, and of course, uh, Super Soul comes up there and proceeds to screw him, and then gets caught, and you know, how dare you betray me, this and that. He gets chased off by the farmer. Then he winds up at a hotel where this hot, uh, deaf and dumb black girl is the daughter of the hotel manager, and, and he is told to completely stay away from her, which, guess what, that doesn't fucking happen. So he winds up at Super Vixen's uh, service station, run by Super Vixen, who is actually a reincarnation of Super Angel. Now to do this, they had some fucking fireworks display on a peak, and then Super Angel shows up, blood trickling down her face, and she's reincarnated as Super Vixen. Of course... Harry Sledge shows up, and it's like none of these people know each other, and there's some weird shit going on where Harry Harry tries to, to seduce Ange, um, Super Vixen, and it doesn't work, and um, Cliff is sent on a wild goose chase, and then Harry grabs Super Vixen, and it's on, because now we're hitting into fucking Wiley Coyote Roadrunner territory. Um... He's basically got her stake down on a mountain, and he's basically throwing fucking dynamite in a bag of dynamite that he's throwing at Cliff, trying to get up the mountain. He's dressed up in some fucking army fatigue jacket, a fucking beret with a cigar in his mouth. Um, he basically, <laughs> this is, I, I'm telling you, this is, it's, that's how fucked up this is. Um, he basically shoots Cliff in the leg after placing the last stick of dynamite on a long fuse in between Super Vixen's legs. Um, the long fuse is sputtering, uh, from about a mile away, he throws a knife that hits fucking Cliff in the thigh, and he goes down, I mean, this, this is how fucking crazy this is, he runs up and picks up Cliff and throws him on top of Super Cherry, sticks the stick of dynamite in his ass and takes off, but the stick sputters out. He picks up the stick and makes some comment about, I'll never buy Polish dynamite again, goes down the hill and the fucking thing actually goes off and kills him. 
So that was Super Vixens. What I didn't tell you is that in the beginning of Super Vixens, we're halfway through the movie, we're to the part where basically he's fucking staking out Sh Cherry, I think, on the mountain, or Super Vixen rather, staking her out on the mountain. So many fucking chicks should get confused. And then all of a sudden, the fucking whiteout happens. The film goes up. And we're like, what the fuck? Film must have broke. Then the whole theater goes dark. So we're sitting there, and Jimmy goes, I guess he's splicing the film. Well, a few minutes go by, and I'm like, okay, you know, maybe he's in the dark splicing the film. Well, a few minutes turn into about 15 minutes. All of a sudden, the house lights go on. The fire department comes in. Management's refunding our money. And it seems, I guess, the projectionist, the story we heard later on, was rubbing one out and had a heart attack. And the reel ended. So, of course, we go back the next next day, because we're not going to get fucked out of seeing this. We're already wrapped up in the whole storyline. So we go back, and we have to see the co-feature, Up. Up starts out with the Hitler lookalike getting uh, a little B&D S&M by some masked people, and... Uh, there's a big rubber cock involved, and we're almost ready to leave because Hitler gets butt-fucked in this whole deal while being stretched out over this thing. And we're, okay, what are we fucking going to see now? Because this, this is getting real fucking bizarre. Well, the Hitler lookalike goes to take a bath, and some masked woman comes in and throws a fucking piranha in the bathtub that eats his dick. Well, that's murder number one. This is going to be a murder mystery, and it's narrated by Kitten Batividad, who was uh, Russ's latest flame at this point. And she's the Greek chorus sitting nude in a tree and told the story later on that uh, how ants were getting into her pussy and things like that. Um, anyway, she had a thick uh, Spanish accent because she was from Mexico, so Russ cut out all her fucking lines and spliced in some uh, British chick's voice. Okay, so she's basically, you know, the overseer of this whole thing narrating the action. So... Now we pan to this very buxom brunette running down the road with uh, the Sheriff Homer, Ho Officer Homer, I'm not making this up, following her. This is Raven de la Croix, an uh, infamous stripper from back in the day who, of course, you know, she had huge tits and rough, Russ wanted her. So, you know, he goes, oh, I'll give you a ride into town. She goes, no, I'd rather jog. This is how I get my exercise. Well, in an interview, she said that Russ had her running all over the fucking place for some reason. So, all right, this pickup truck shows up, and it's the same line, some redneck trying to pick her up, which she eventually gets into the truck, but instead of taking her where she wants to be taken, he takes her down some fucking dirt road and basically beats the shit out of her and starts raping her in a stream. And I mean, this is another, her getting thrown in the water, her getting double stomped by this guy, beating the fucking piss out of her, and then raping her. Well, she gets even by breaking his back. Well, Sheriff Homer shows up and sort of like, you know, has Johnny on the spot, has ideas of his own where um, he can make this all go better because he can say there was a horrible accident, the pickup truck was falling off the thing, he fell to his, the guy fell to his death and broke his back, but Officer Homer managed to rescue uh, Margot Winchester, which is her name. So she agrees to this and becomes his living. So there's another couple that Alice and this other guy that have a restaurant which they they need help and then uh, of course uh, the ever friendly officer Homer suggests why not put Margo in there because the place will be packed and they don't even care if the fucking food's good. Well, Margo is a fucking smash in there, total smash. But this one lumberjack, this big blonde Sven-looking type guy, keeps coming in and carrying an axe with him. So they make enough money that they're about to open a second place, Alice's place number two or something like that. The place is packed. Everybody's getting drunk. This lumberjack comes in. He's pounding down beers when Margot comes in, and she's supposed to make a speech but does her infamous strip act. Well, of course, everybody's all horny, especially the lumberjack that basically throws her up against the bar, starts ripping her clothes off, and when the owner bartender tries to intervene, he gets knocked silly. <clears throat> the lumberjack throws her on a table and starts raping her in full view of the whole crew. This one's getting really out of hand. Well, the, the bartender comes to, tries again, once again to stop her. Sheriff Homer comes in, he gets knocked on his ass. 
Alice tries to stop her, only he rips, throws Alice across the room, then drags her back, rips her clothes off, puts her on top of uh, Margo, and starts raping the both of them. Well, Officer Homer gets up, takes his axe, and puts it through the guy's back. The guy rolls off, and he's trying to help the chicks up. But this guy's like the Frankenstein monster. He reaches back, pulls the axe out of his back, and hits Officer Homer in the chest. Officer Homer's laying on the floor with the axe in his chest. His breastbone, to be exact. But okay, the lumberjack picks up the two girls and heads for the hills with them. Homer gets up and pulls the axe out of his chest. He spies a chainsaw hanging on the wall. He gets the chainsaw, goes after the lumberjack. There's, you know, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre inspired, you know, chainsaw through the fucking abdomen, blood flying back in his face. The two of them go rolling off the cliff into their death while Margot and Alice huddle and cover each other. Well, that was murder number three. Okay, so now Margot goes back to her house to unwind. Or, well, now it's her house because obviously Officer Homer's fucking dead. And finds that there's a masked figure that attacks her in the shower. Well, that's Alice. Now this whole thing gets convoluted, and I'll explain this so you don't have to fucking bother, you know, going through the... You know, the two women are running naked through the woods, chasing each other. Alice has a knife, which she loses several times. It seems that Alice is the daughter of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. And that was actually Hitler back there. Eva took one for the team, she says, or something. But it winds up that Mark was actually an undercover officer who arrests them and goes to her next assignment, which never was, because I don't think Russ ever used her again. Um, according to the book and interviews, this is sort of around the time when Russ started slipping mentally. There's a lot of, like, gay overtures, undertones, or overtures, or whatever, in this, and sort of in, um, Super Vixens. Um, Russ made a lot more movies that I, unfortunately, uh, haven't had a chance to check out yet, because, uh, I'm just going by the four I had seen theatrically. Um, I have picked up this DVD, which brings me to the next part of how things got fucked up for Russ, and how basically, while Russ was making these films and fighting with the ratings boards to get whatever he needed to get, all the majors were sitting on the sidelines watching and waiting. Because it was guys like Russ Meyer, Dave Friedman, Bob Cressy, and others that took the fight against censorship to courts, and sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. But like I said, corporate major studios were just sitting on the side waiting to see what happens. As God forbid, they enter the fray and put their money up. They let these guys do it. Of course, we all know what happened. It all got absorbed into the mainstream. But Russ, the only thing Russ did as far as releasing his films uh, for home video was basically start his own uh, video cassette uh, company, uh, when he found out from Dave Friedman how profitable it was to reissue his old films, he jumped right on the bandwagon, except Russ was judge, jury, and executioner. If you bought a film, you called up, you might have been speaking to Russ himself. He was doing the whole thing, and all his films were $59.95 or $79.95. They weren't cheap. I remember a situation where Rick Sullivan of the Gore Gazette was bootlegging Black Snake, and Russ was all over him. Uh, Rick thought he could do it because he had Russ out at one of his dive events. Uh, Russ just told him, don't fucking do it again. Okay, so Russ, unfortunately, was ailing, and he had hired a secretary. Now, this is where you really need to read the book, because it explains in detail how this secretary and a handyman basically undermined everyone who was friends with Russ and who was around Russ, and Russ was suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. And they basically cornered his whole estate. They wouldn't allow people that were close to him, like Kitten, Haji, Dave Friedman, his war buddies, any of those guys, Charlie Napier, any of those guys to get near him. And basically, they controlled the whole estate. And Russ passed away at age 82. Uh, he was brought at the Chiller Theater by Dave Friedman. I had the privilege of meeting him and shaking his hand. Um, but, again, he was sort of like suffering, you know, 
with the Alzheimer's, it was sort of kicking in because at one point he'd be standing there going, I'm having a great time. Then two minutes later, you know, this place really sucks. And he opened his Q&A with, well, I'm a tit man to a mixed audience. So that was Russ. That was, you know, the one time I did meet and get to see Russ. Um, but these two card artists, for lack of better words, somehow finagled control of his estate. And the sad part is that a couple of DVDs have been put out by this jerk-off handyman, strictly from the VHS tapes. Uh, they're floating around on eBay. They don't look good. Um, they jump. And it's sad because too much time has passed. And, you know, people like Charlie Napier, Tura Santana, um, Haji, and others, his army buddies, other people who work with him, are all no longer with us. And it's a completely missed opportunity because these people could have vastly contributed, you know, their own reminiscences of Russ for extras on a Blu-ray release. But due to the greed and selfishness of these people, who I don't want to mention their name on camera because that might come back to haunt me, but they are mentioned in this book, which I hope is still in print. Um, so you can see for yourself, but, you know... Really, out of that whole era, the only ones left are, are Kit and Ushi. And uh, who knows what kind of condition the actual film prints might be in at this stage, or the negatives. Because, you know, when you're dealing with people who don't give a shit about anything but the bottom line, the almighty dollar, you know, this shit happens. And like I said, it's a fucking crime. Because Russ Meyer is probably, along with Andy Milligan maybe, one of the guys that maybe his works have been destroyed. I mean, you know, in Milligan's case, some of his prints were supposedly uh, melted down for the silver nitrate. Uh, several films, I don't know how many, three or four or five maybe, but like I said, you know, Russ's stuff could have been taken care of, and it just wasn't. And, you know, it, it's just a sad footnote in Grindhouse history. Again, let me put this up here, so, you know, maybe you can find that on eBay, maybe it's still in print, but it, it's well worth the read, you know. Um... I just feel bad because, um, you know, it's a big piece of, you know, exploitation history and a big piece of film history that basically, you know, will never be because, you know, unless somebody takes action real soon and it might be, honestly, too late to take action. I mean, the elements may be curated to the point where they can't be used. But, you know, Russ was an American original, one of those guys whose work was unique, and I'm glad I met him and... Uh, I know there's, I'm going to put this over because I don't give a fuck. Um, there's a DVD out there, a Blu-ray, it's a bootleg, and it's by Second Sales. Uh, they're on Facebook, and it has a whole bunch of his movies on it, on two, you know, Blu-ray R's, and uh, they look good. Uh, that's where I revisited some of this stuff. They look really good. Um, he, he, I think it's, uh, oh, Sloppy Second Sale. That's Sales, that's the name of them. He's on Facebook. He may have a website. I don't know. You know, I'm promoting a bootleg, but hey, you know something? If you can't get it one way and somebody doesn't want to fucking go through the time and effort of doing it the right way, what the fuck, right? All right, well, that's all I got for now. This is 42nd Street Pete saying thanks again for subscribing and watching. Uh, mask the fuck up. Stay safe. Stay sick, and we'll see you on the flip side.